Hey everyone, this is Carlos, CEO at Product School. Today I'm here with Frederic De Todaro, who is the Chief Product Officer at Chameleon. Welcome to the show. Hi, Carlos. Thanks, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be to be here with you. <laughs> hey, Fred. Why don't we start by learning more about your product? What what is Chameleon all about? Yeah, I mean, I mean, Chameleon. So we are in the experimentation space. So our mission is basically to empower uh, you know our customers to uh, experiment their way. Uh, so when I'm talking about experimentation, I put behind that uh, you know big world uh, world i put a b testing feature management and feature experimentation so we are basically uh, you know a leader in the, in that in that industry in that field well you're using the word industry and i agree today it's definitely much bigger than it was because your company has been around for over 10 years right yeah actually a little bit more than that 11 years uh, so uh, and i joined the company at uh, at this time so um, you know the, the company was uh, was uh, launching uh, from a commercial standpoint and i joined at uh, at this time so um, i think i was like the, the employee number six in the company so today cameroon is more than 200 uh, people uh, you know we work with thousands of brands uh, in all types of industry as soon as you have a business basically uh, you know online because the idea is to uh, to, to uh, you know optimize the user experience or the product experience um and uh, yeah but, you know uh, i joined at this stage basically so very so a lot of so a lot of people in our community are familiar with the concept of a b testing and that's kind of how this industry started i remember 10 12 years ago there wasn't like experimentation wasn't really a thing. Like people were A-B testing colors, buttons, copy on their website, and now it evolved into what it is today. So I would love to learn more from your own experience. What happened? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So when we uh, we started, we basically uh, kind of disrupted a little bit that uh, industry, which was, uh, you know, owned by uh, suits like uh, Google. Adobe, but everything was very complex uh, to put in place. So we came with uh, that idea uh, to make A/B testing simple for our, our customers. So uh, with you know graphic editor, you were able to uh, basically change everything on your website, and it changed basically the, the way you know people were, were experimenting. And so uh, you know we were targeting first marketing teams, but now it's much bigger than that. Uh, if you look at uh, you know, uh, the, the biggest company in the place, uh, you know, Google, Netflix, uh, Amazon, there are thousands of experiments every year. And there is a direct correlation between, uh, you know, the number of experiments you run and, uh, you know, the revenue you are generating. So it's uh, it's really uh, something critical. It's, uh, I can say it's a, it's a product approach uh, sometimes. And, uh, yeah, now now I would say that uh, product teams are more and more experimenting. Uh, so what does it mean? Because it's it's much broader than uh, you know when you you, you run A/B testing uh, from a, from a digital standpoint. By experimentation, I mean you know being able to release your features progressively to your users. That's uh, an experiment. Uh, but it's also you know how you display your feature to your end user. So. Uh, Sometimes you know you don't agree on design or you don't agree on the technology, so you are able to A/B test to A/B to A/B test that. And so in a way, it's uh, you know really uh, embedded into the, the, the development cycle uh, of any any feature today. So what are other types of uh, experiments beyond A/B testing? Um, yeah, I would say again you. Let's let's say in a typical uh, release cycle, you you basically develop your your feature, then you uh, test it in a let's say a staging environment, and then you push it in production, and you basically uh, you know try to, to 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 figure out if it if it goes well uh, or not, and most of the time it, it goes wrong, right? So with with uh, an experiment, you can put your features behind the flag, and then you release that feature you know into production, but that feature is not visible to your to your end user, so that's what we call experimentation, and 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 um, but that's something really important because I think uh, I don't know if, you, if you've seen that, but Spotify, you know, recently uh, released something about you know uh, the, the experiments they, they are running, um, you know, on the website. Uh, we always think that an experiment is an A/B test, but actually, seventy-five percent of our experiments are feature flags. 
uh, and progressive rollout. So it means that you know the the approach is, is much bigger than just A/B testing. It's a way for you to release uh, a better product, uh, a better feature to your users by uh, you know embracing basically feature flagging and feature management. So experiment so when experimentation today is A/B testing plus you know what we call now feature management and experimentation. Yeah, so feature management or, or, or feature flags, uh, are you referring to the uh, ability to show certain features to some users and hide it for others? Absolutely, absolutely. So a feature you, is in production, then you are able to say, you know, that, 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 can, that types of users, they will not see that feature because maybe you, know, you want to test it first with some of your users before then releasing it to everybody. Uh, so it's an iterative process. Uh, you know, instead of releasing that feature to everybody, you start with a group of users. Usually, it's, you know, there are internal stakeholders uh, like you know CSMs, uh, customer success management. They can access the feature before their customers, so they can they can play with it, uh, and it allows basically product teams to figure out you know if the feature works or not for for their users before releasing it you know globally to hold to hold their users yeah because before there were some SaaS products uh, offering this this type of uh, solution to a lot of other companies i know large companies even meta they they built their own engines right they were releasing certain features or experiments to a percentage of uh, their the user base and then from there they would decide how to roll it out but that was very time consuming and uh, you required a lot of people and energy and resources. And now with these new SaaS tools, pretty much anyone, even a small startup, can have access to these type of capabilities. I think that is what kind of triggered this whole evolution from A-B testing to like an entire industry called experimentation. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's perfectly right. I mean, it was before luxury uh, to some product teams, you know, big product teams who had, you know, uh, uh, the money to invest in such in such uh, tools, uh, but it's, it's it's not the case for for whole teams. So basically, we provide you know a solution so that all teams can experiment their way. If you are a digital team, you can use simple graphic editor to um, you know to change the messaging, uh, change images, or even you know global layout of a page. And for product teams, it goes you know. Uh, within the, the development cycle, so that you can, you can release you know properly your features to, to the market, uh, and it's a way uh, you know we like to call it experiment-led growth, uh, because basically what you are trying to achieve is putting in the hand of your users uh, the perfect feature, and perfect means that you need you know a lot of iterations and so on, and before. Uh, you know that feature feature management uh, existed. You had to release, you know, your feature in production. You look at the impact, and then you iterate from from there. Now with feature flags, that iteration comes before uh, that feature is available to all users. So it makes a big difference. And so when it reaches basically all your users, well, you are sure that you are delivering the, the best value possible to your users. So what are some misconceptions around experimentation? Yeah, there, there, there are plenty, plenty of them. I would say, you know, the first one is, uh, well, it will slow down my my delivery, so I don't want to put that in place and so on. Well, actually, I wouldn't say it slow down. You know, it makes the, the whole thing more flexible, more agile, because again, you are able to release that feature in production. You are able to test it in production, so you are sure about the impact. Uh, and then you iterate from that point up to raising that feature to, to everybody. So it actually makes it much more faster <laughs> than slowing it down. The second one I would say is, uh, you know, if I do my product discovery right, why do I care about experimenting? Well, uh, you never know because you can do all the discovery you want and so on. You are only sure about the value when the users will actually test your feature and, and play with it. And so, uh, uh, you know, they are kind of complementary. I like to say that, uh, you know, uh, both qualitative and quantitative approach, they are, they are complementary. Uh, so qualitative would be, you know, user testing, uh, you know, all that stuff. And, and quantitative, you use experimentation to get the right metrics. 
the right insights about your about your feature, and then you have you have a bunch of other uh, I would say misconceptions like it's bad for performance. Well, actually, you are able to measure <laughs> the impact on performance because your your feature is live in production, so you can measure the impact uh, on on performance uh, before you know you, you it hits all your your, your users. Uh, and and maybe the the, the last one, which is a uh, you know, one of the most common the, the common, common misconception is, I don't know where to start. Uh, and what I usually uh, you know tell 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 uh, product teams is that start with simple feature flags. You know, and the cost is really nothing. It's a if else in your code, but it brings you a lot of value. Again, you can test that in production uh, before 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 putting that to everybody. Um, and then, you know, move to progressive rollout. So progressive rollout is that, you know, your feature will be available progressively to your users. And then you can, you can measure the impact, you can measure the insights, uh, you know, delivered by your first users uh, that are exposed to your feature. And then you, you, you move to A-B test. Uh, but run an A-B test when you are lacking some evidence. If you have evidence, well, you don't have to, uh, to, uh, to run an experiment every time. To me, the biggest risk that I've seen in the organizations that we, <clears throat> we train, and I'm talking about large organizations that are not in high tech companies, so financial services, insurance, healthcare, <clears throat> it's more of a cultural risk. It's the, it's the risk of failure, right? It's the risk of what if something goes wrong. And um, <clears throat> trying to create that type of psychological safety around, that's actually what we're trying to do. Like we are trying to re, to to fail relatively small to the risk before exactly. we do something much bigger, but it's so hard because sometimes it's not a technological issue. Like yeah, there are tools that allow you to to run those tests. It's more about well, what happens if the test doesn't work? Like how is that going to be perceived by the rest of the team or even my my boss? So uh, we we try to work with those executives to to show the value that this has on the business and, and how to incentivize and reward that there's more experimentation and assume that, in fact, as you mentioned before, a lot of experiments, if not most experiments, might not be successful. And that's actually a good thing. Yeah, no, you, you, you're right. I guess one of the, you know, one of the way to, to look at that is to uh, kind of incentivize you know, product teams uh, with concrete results uh, like you know, we, we, we all talk about okay errors and so on. We have to be close to, uh, to the business, uh, you know, like, you know, you, you need to increase the number of upsells on that feature or you need to increase that metric, uh, which is directly correlated to, to the business. And then you will start, but you will, you, 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 will, uh, you will see that more and more product teams will, uh, you know, kind of uh, put experimentation in place because, again, this is the only way for them to show that they have achieved the results. By running an experiment, you know, it's a, it's a statistical approach. There is no other approach today in this market uh, that brings, you know, that, uh, that, that results there are for product teams. So this is how we, we did it at Cameroon, uh, you know. Um, <laughs> that was the same at Cameroon. We started doing experimentation like 18 months ago only. Uh, and uh, I, I started, you know, very, very quickly with a, a first product team. So at Cameroon, uh, we have four, 14 product uh, product teams. I started with one, one of them, uh, you know, putting in place first feature flags, receive a value, uh, you know, in releasing better to uh, to market. And then all product teams were requesting, you know, feature flags <laughs> from the moment because they, they saw the, the, the big advantage of uh, putting putting that in place. It's a uh, better quality, uh, less bugs into production, customer happy. Uh, you know, we over I think over the last eighteen months we increased by fifty percent the number of features released to the market with almost the same size of a team. Okay, we didn't increase that much the size of the team, and we decre we increased by twenty five uh, percent the quality of the features that we released to the market. So it's a, it's it's huge numbers there because basically, uh, you know, when I'm releasing a feature, I'm sure that you know there won't be any impact into production, there won't be any bugs, there won't be any frustration from from our customer because I know 
what the future has been tested mm -hmm. uh, before. Whereas before I was like, you know, sleeping bad <laughs> on Friday because yeah. you never right. know how it goes. It puts a lot of pressure on, on the bets that you're making, right? If you have a limited number of shots, you, you better be right. However, if you can, yes. the risk and it also empower others to, to play some bets, it, it creates more of a, 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 a culture around, well, the goal is to win, know who was right. We all need, we all won't have our own shots on target. Um, but I like what you said about testing with your own product, especially because, you know, you can use your own. Um, but what's next? I've seen the evolution of these from A-B testing to now feature management. Obviously, artificial intelligence is playing a big role. So how do you see the impact of artificial intelligence in the future of experimentation? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. So, uh, you know, at, at Cameroon, we have been doing AI since 2016. Uh, so we, we and actually, uh, when I joined, uh, you know, the organization, there were six people. Two of them were already working on machine learning algorithm. And it was back in 2012. And so we released to, uh, to market our first uh, AI capability, which was there to, to basically predict, you know, uh, the, um, uh, the, the purchase. The conversion. So uh, when you land on a, on, a, on, a, on a website, what's your likelihood to basically convert, uh, um, you know, a, a typical e-commerce e goal and so on. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to see that, uh, that new trend today uh, around generative AI. One thing I, that I can tell you is that, uh, well, it's, it's, it's not ready to replace, <laughs> you know, experimenters or, or product teams. Uh, but the, the main idea, and this is what we, we put uh, within our product, is to uh, to be there at each step, you know, of the creation of an experimentation uh, of an experiment, from the ideation process to the analysis. So basically, when you uh, you know ideate how the AI can suggest you some experiments to run on your website. Uh, so that's what we call AI experiments at uh, at Cameroon. When you create an experiment, how do you make sure that you target the right audience? And so this is why we put predictive targeting in place uh, at Cameroon. And then the, la the last step I would say is at the analysis part, you know, uh, analyzing an experiment is uh, is hard. Uh, you, need, you need the right statistical approach. You need to have the right mindset and so on. And not all, not all product teams have uh, today this, uh, this mindset. So the, the idea of AI is to basically, you know, give you the main takeaways of your experiments so that you don't have to, to crunch the data and so on. We also have a feature which, uh, you know, look at, uh, and it's, um, I, I, you know, I'm jumping back on what you, you were saying before, uh, when you run, you know, experiments, uh, there is a high chance that, uh, you know, it will fail. Uh, so it's, you know, experimentation is tough. And so we have a feature that looks at uh, basically inconclusive experiments uh, trying to find, you know, a sub-segment of the audience where it, it works. And so it gives, you know, product teams or, or marketers insights about, you know, uh, the impact of your experiments. Maybe, maybe you know, you, the, the design of your experiment was not correct, but if you change it a little, a little bit, you will, you will make it con conclusive. So this is what, what we, we, we have been working uh, on. And I would say the, uh, maybe the, la the last thing uh, about AI, uh, uh, which I think everybody is betting on, uh, is this ability to predict basically the success of an experiment. Uh, but we, we are not yet there because basically it would it would mean predicting the behaviors of all visitors who are going to be exposed to that experiment to make sure this is it's or not. And this is before running the experiment itself? Yes, exactly. Exactly. You know, many customers are asking that, you know, uh, uh, can, can you tell me if that experiment will be a success? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's very, very complex. And I think, you know, the, the company that will, uh, you know, uh, come out with that feature, well, they will kill everybody else <laughs> in, this, yeah. in this market. It's like, you know, with this movie, I think uh, you, you, you've seen this movie uh, called Minor Minority Report, where uh, Tom Cruise plays in it, uh, where, they, you know, they kind of predict some, the, you know, future crimes. <laughs> and, it, you know, it reminds me that, 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 that money even though, you know, the purpose yeah. is not the same, of course, but uh, it's to predict yeah. basically the impact of, uh, of an experiment, which is really... Yeah, I mean, I see, I, I see so many applications, right? So you can really augment the number of experiments you want to run or, or variations of that. And if, if you can even get some estimates before running them, like you can get to the truth faster. Um, 
but I've seen also in other other products for product managers uh, outside experimentation how this uh, concept of assistant or, or co-pilot exactly. is helping people create experiences from scratch much faster because now it's not oh my god I want to run let's say an, an experiment well you can type what you are trying to do and it can at least include the template and fill it up with th certain things that are more good practices so it, you still have to put in the work you can still customize what you need but you have someone along the way that can help you build faster but also in a way that it's also better yeah absolutely and i mean faster sometimes means you know uh, kind of autom automating you know all the simple experiments sometimes you know people will spend a lot of time you know changing the wording, changing simple layout. And that's the kind of experiment that, uh, you know, you shouldn't care about, actually. And AI can be there, and this is what we uh, we, we have been releasing uh, and announcing to the market uh, a couple of month, uh, months ago, uh, This is which is this ability to uh, to scale the experiments, uh, the experimentation program, by taking care of all the simple experiments, you know, that take that Took, took a lot of time usually, uh, and uh, so that you can you can concentrate yourself on, on the big bets uh, that the AI can't uh, basically uh, come 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 up with uh, some 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 ideas or some suggestions. So, so I, I can see how this 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 type of experimentation can help people improve their product experience. At the same time, what about the qualitative feedback? Like how do you balance the interacting with the customer and learning more about why they are doing certain things in addition to using A-B testing or experimentation to uh, fully understand what they're doing? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, the, the, exp the, well, the, the principle of an experiment, it, it, it will tell you, uh, you know, the what, basically. So does it work or does it, you know, does it not work for basically, but it doesn't tell you the why. And the why that, that's something that can can be uh, can be handled by the, by the AI. Uh, I was talking about you know that, that feature that looks at sub segments and so and so on. That's part of the story basically because when someone is not working as expected, the AI will tell you, yeah, but it, it works basically when you look at all these uh, other sub segments there. So why don't you change your experiment and target to the, these customers? Then it can also help. But that's a, that's, I would say that's a different uh, market. Uh, you know, we are, we are not in this market where you look at qualitative feedbacks uh, for people who are exposed to, uh, to an experiment. Uh, but I, I see that uh, some, some products are helping. They are you know, looking at all the feedbacks, all the server answers so that they can figure out you know, some insights. But then you can use uh, to build your own map of experiments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, at the end of the day, for you as a chief product officer, uh, ultimately want to decide what's the right thing to build next. And yeah. the quantitative part is, is critical. Um, exactly. I, I was just wondering like, what else is important to take in, into consideration in order not to just hit a local maximum and just over-optimize something that it's still not going to get you uh, something else that uh, an experiment is just missing. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure, absolutely. Yeah. I agree. Um, well, let's switch gears and talk a little more about how you are thinking about the strategy. Your business has a few unique elements. So first, I noticed that you guys have been profitable for a very long time. Um, so yeah. how, that, how does that business decision influence how you go about building your roadmap? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So, I mean, I, I believe, you know, uh, it goes with um, kind of fostering a shared mindset across the organization. Uh, it, it is key uh, for this approach to, uh, to work efficiently. And, you know, the, the, the SaaS market is, uh, is extremely tough uh, and highly competitive. This is partly because it's uh, an uneven playing field. Uh, by, by that, I mean that some vendors have, have raised, you know, by the past uh, substantial funding without any focus on profitability. Uh, now it's not the case uh, anymore since 2023, where you know it's not uh, you know nice to have. Now being profitable is a must uh, have, and uh, it's an event because over our companies uh, like Camelot, we didn't raise that much money uh, compared to uh, you know most of the vendors in uh, in the same industry, and uh, we had to make uh, the right product investment uh, since the origin of you know the company, um, and so. 
you know, from the beginning, our company has re-emphasized, uh, I would say, building a profitable business, uh, being in such an environment uh, um, has influenced, I would say, uh, my approach, uh, um, you know, my, my team approach to, uh, to, to product management. I had to develop uh, this mindset, you know, focused on making, making sound product decisions uh, that align with the company's goals uh, of sustainable growth. Uh, because, uh, you know, I, I believe that a, a product team is... Is not doing uh, its job its uh, job correctly if it does not consider the impact on the business. It's not enough to just care about the users. We also need to consider the impact on our growth uh, and ensure uh, we are doing it sustain sustainably. And one way to to achieve this is uh, you know by linking product metrics like adoption, usage, retention, and so on to business goals, you know, upsells, uh, new signature, and, and so forth. And at Camelon, we have implemented a, a, that, uh, an approach which is basically centered around, uh, uh, I'm sure you, you know the concept, of, you know, around finding a North Star metric uh, that reflects both the health of our business and our customers. And then by setting OKR, so objective and key results, on input metrics that influence uh, this North Star metric, we focus on building the right features because we know that when that North Star metric goes up or down, it directly impacts our growth and the usage of our platform. So that's how we did it basically. So are you saying that when you when you pick a certain initiative that is associated with an OKR? Yeah, always and always related to uh, to the North Star metric, and that North and Star metric is related to the health of our business. And and then. Being profitable, and, and I respect and I love that, we are profitable as well. And way before, it was the only option for a lot of tech companies. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, you also have some clients that are larger than others, right? So when you have this uh, classic situation where one of your large clients is asking for something that clearly is going to drive revenue, um, but what is the logic behind saying yes, knowing if some of these features maybe are not going to be easy to apply to the larger user base. Yeah, it's. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a good uh, it's a good question uh, as well uh, here. Uh, well, when you look at what we build, basically uh, in a product, you usually build you know what, what customers uh, you know a piece of what customers request. Uh, you also build you know what what customer will need. Uh, so they don't they don't basically express the needs, but you know that it will become a need. And basically, you build what 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 you know brings uh, you know a, a business to uh, to the organization. So, uh, uh, and uh, what we do what we do at, at Cameroon is that we kind of balance you know uh, each of these categories. Uh, you start with uh, you know low ROI, you know, uh, uh, but also. Uh, you know, this what we call low hanging hanging fruit. So basically, you know, feature announcement. Then you look at, uh, you know, uh, uh, emerging trends. Uh, you know, shift in the market uh, that becomes either you know product initiatives or big big projects. They are a little bit more risky, but uh, still you can control them. And then you you basically uh, bet uh, on the next uh, the next capability, the future basically of uh, of uh, you know uh, your product. I was saying at the beginning that in 2012 we were already looking at AI. Uh, those are big bets uh, that you you put because they are they are high risk. You spend a lot of uh, a lot of money, a lot of investment building these uh, these features, and so you have to find the right ba the right balance between between these three categories basically. Yeah, yeah, I think that is uh, something to always keep in mind. Like short term revenue kind of dri drive the the roadmap. Ultimately, there is you can decide the level of concentration and risk you want to take, but I think allocating some percentage of the bets to long term, allocating some percentage of the bets to just user satisfaction, tech debt, and ensuring that 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 you are providing an excellent service, uh, it's still there. O otherwise, next time you know you are optimizing for the for the biggest player, and then uh, forgetting about everybody else. And and the reality is that you are building something for hundreds of thousands of people like you're powering websites that are used by millions and millions of people so uh, that's this constant tension between you know building a SaaS as a building a platform for others versus just building a service for yourself yeah and especially true in the b2b uh, business that's why it's very hard <laughs> usually because you have a lot of requests coming from uh, from new customers from yep. leads 
and you, you need to take them into account. So it's not enough to just care about, you know, your, your customer needs. You also need to care about, you know, the, the next, uh, I would say, initiative there. And, and, and another thing that I, I, I appreciate about your company, you, you guys started mostly in, in Europe. You mentioned you have a team of around 200 people and you have clients also in the U.S. I've seen a lot of companies that did the reverse commute. They mostly started in the U.S., build their user client base here, and then they expanded into Europe. So I'm curious to learn from your own experience, how did you approach that expansion into the U.S. and the, any adjustments you had to make into your own product? Yeah, oh man, it's a, it's a good it's a good one. <laughs> it's a good question. So uh, it's true that uh, you know we uh, we are very known in Europe, and uh, we uh, actually uh, expand expanding in, in the U.S. market very late compared to uh, you know all our, all our all our competitors there. Usually, what, what I like to uh, to answer to that question is that you need to enter a market when you have a chance to succeed. Uh, if you only look at entering the market for your image, you will lose every time there. And I've seen many companies actually going to the US, you know, because it's, it's nice to be in the US, but then you know, getting back uh, to Europe because they were not signing any any contract. So uh, we made we made that decision to enter the U.S. market because we had a chance to uh, to succeed there. We were looking at you know movement in the market uh, as well in the U.S. and it was it was a good time for us at this time to enter that uh, that market. And uh, we have been very uh, happy so far with uh, you know the results and so on. And it actually changed the face of our product as well uh, because. You know the experimentation market is, is tough for, for, from uh, you know uh, many standpoints. The, f the first one is you know uh, you know each market are very different. If you look at France, Germany, or US, they are so different. Uh, the French market is uh, is maybe more personalization oriented, uh, maybe less mature uh, than in um, you know in Germany where the market is way more technical. Uh, they look at you know how the product works. Uh, if they are asking very technical questions uh, during deals, which is not the case at all uh, in France. And when you look at the U.S. market, it's very, it is very product oriented. Uh, actually, the, the budget of experimentation is uh, owned by product teams. Uh, and uh, that makes a, a big difference because usually they are looking at experimentation more from the feature uh, management or experimentation uh, lens. Uh, and so we had to, uh, to adapt uh, our roadmap uh, to, to, to take that into account because, of course, the U.S. market is one of our biggest markets uh, today. So we have we have to consider, you know, U.S. requests, uh, U.S. customer needs, uh, which sometimes do not make any sense for European customers. But that's okay. That's part of your product strategy. Uh, basically, you decide to to do that for a purpose, which is to uh, you know, sometimes increase the business of the company. But you need to be sure that you know, it will become a need as well in Europe. And so that's what we look at sometimes, you know, when there is a very complex feature uh, which is being asked by, uh, by US, custo US customers, we tend to, uh, to try to figure out if that feature will become, you know, a, a must have for our French or German customer or, you know, UK, UK based customers. And you have to balance that, uh, basically. But thank you so much for your time, Fred. It's been a pleasure to learn from you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Carlos, for, for having me. It was a pleasure, too.